In 2006, I felt a tiny fraction of what Roger just presented, a tiny, tiny fraction. And I felt we could be fucked. So I was a venture capitalist. I've been an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, and I thought, what can I do? I did what we do in Silicon Valley. I created a Facebook game, which was a simulation showing how the environment gets worse and worse. And I raised a half a million dollars from the EPA, and I thought, this is great. It didn't work. No one played the game. And if they played the game, they didn't take the real world action that I wanted them to take to show that they can lower their emissions in doing it. I kept looking on my journey of what to do, and I was reminded by seeing Al Gore on stage and Ted, and seeing John Doerr, one of the most famous venture capitalists, who's crying on stage next to his daughter, eliciting maybe 1% of the emotions of the people that are what they're doing, the, the brave work in Extinction Rebellion. And I thought, okay, let me do what I do best, which is being a venture capitalist. So I've tried to find what are the big sources of emissions, and transportation is one of them. And I looked and saw, how can we take all these great things we've developed in Silicon Valley, like network effects, the more people that use a product, the better it gets, YouTube, Facebook, eBay. Could we apply that to transportation? Because it's not efficient right now. So many people put their hand up that they own a car. The average car is used 4% of the time. 96% of the time, your car is sitting idle. That's what inspired me to find this company called Zimride in 2010. And I led the investment at Mayfield. And I loved it so much that in 2016, I moved from being a venture capitalist flying around in a private jet to coming into Lyft and trying to make a difference full time. So I'll talk to you about my view on what I got through that experience. But again, it is a fraction, I think, of the emotion and what we should be doing in our life to make a difference here. So to talk about the future, let's first go to the past. New York City, 1900. Horse and buggies everywhere. This is Easter Day Parade. How important is transportation in cities? Very important. How quickly does innovation move in transportation? This wasn't the age of the internet. There's no social media, no internet, no television. And in 13 years, well, before I moved there, there was one automobile in 1900 on that street. So in 13 short years, look at it now. 13 years, no internet, no social media. Automobiles everywhere, except one horse and buggy that stayed. By 1927, 15 million Ford Model Ts were produced. This is one of the largest mass production items ever done. And all of a sudden, we were on the way to what we thought was the promised land, which is that cities were being created around cars. Roads were connecting cities. And we thought that we had the solution. And now what we face is a massive, even more massive trend towards urbanization. Over the next 15 years, two and a half billion more people will move into cities. And by 2050, two thirds of the entire world's population will be in a city. Is transportation going to work the way it has worked? Are cars going to work for us the way that they did initially, giving us that freedom? Can we just build more roads? Is that gonna solve the problem? This is what happens when you build more roads. Studies have shown more roads means more congestion. And congestion is a big problem, probably the noticeable problem, unlike climate change, which is a frog in boiling water. You can see this every day when you commute. So the automobile has caused other issues too. Accidents. Not only accidents, but the thing that is overlooked is the number of people that die from respiratory problems related to vehicle emissions. It's even larger than the number of people that are dying in auto accidents in the United States. And not only have we built roads, but we've taken away a lot of our cities and made them into parking. 14% of LA is now parking. There are several parking spaces for every car bought in the United States. And today still, most people drive alone, which is what initially I invested in Zimride to change and Lyft to change. And of course, we know this. We just talked about it, we thought about it, it's real, it's there, which is that it's not just cars, it's the fact that they are gasoline-powered engines, which is the problem as well. One fact also, one other problem that's caused is the access to transportation is actually an issue at the heart of income inequality. Many studies have shown that if you don't provide cost-effective, reliable transportation to low-income areas, that they will not be able to get jobs, they will not get out of the poverty that they're in. So it's an imperative from an economic perspective, not just because you want to get somewhere from point A to point B and you don't like traffic in doing it. So with that, what is the solution that's there? Well, don't ask me, but McKinsey and the top 40 cities trying to make a difference in sustainability got together and they identified these are the five criteria of the future successful transportation system in a city. They're pretty obvious, but it's also pretty obvious that cars aren't going to get us there. What's also then came out of this is that it's not just about one mode, it's about multiple modes. 
It's not just about transit, even though that's doing much better in Europe than it is in the U.S. It's about walking. It's about utilizing cars to get more out of them. It's everything that's there together. And so they concluded that seamless mobility across multiple modes can have the biggest impact. They ran a huge model against Paris and came out with this set of conclusions here that it's going to help in every single one of those attributes. So we need to move to seamless mobility. What is Lyft doing? First of all, we are trying to hasten the end of car ownership. It doesn't work. Consumers, young people, maybe not you, because you're all, like me, pretty old, are still seeking your identity out of your car. It defines who you are. Young people really don't give a shit about that. They don't want to own. They want to access Netflix, Spotify. So what we want to do is get people signed up to transportation as a service, where you open your phone and you have all of the options that are there. Whether we own them or not, transit, bike share, we have the largest bike share in the country now, scooters, even car rentals we just launched a couple months ago. And packing this together because it's better than the alternative of owning a vehicle, which is the second largest expense for an American after their housing, more than food, and they're barely using it. So we've seen some success. We've seen that people are starting already to use multiple modes in the United States. And we've seen that things like bikes in New York, we own the city bike. If you go to New York, you'll see the bikes everywhere in the docking stations. It's really starting to work. There's hope there. The next piece of it is also to add in self-driving. Why is that important. We'll talk about how it's important for consumers, but from a city perspective, it really does make a big difference, but it cannot just be self-driving alone. I did not join Lyft to launch self-driving. I joined Lyft to launch self-driving that is shared and that is 100% electric. We need all of those things to happen. The self-driving system is overhyped. We need that whole thing to happen for us to make a difference that's there. We know it's going to help the consumer in all those areas. So where are we on this journey? We just launched self-driving. It is here. It's now. It's early though. It works in very limited capabilities. It's expensive, but over time and over many years, it'll get better and better. This is not going to be a flash like the iPhone. It's going to take years to roll out. And the statistics are good so far. We've had almost 100,000 paid rides with self-driving cars in the United States in Las Vegas and Arizona with Waymo, which is Google and Aptiv, another partner. And people are rating it even higher than their normal Lyft rides that are there. So it's very promising that people are taking this up. So what does this future look like? Leaving on a high note here, the car is going to be reimagined. We're going to be looking at vehicles like cabins like we do in an airplane. You don't care if it's a Boeing or an Airbus. Maybe you do. But what you care about is you have a nice seat. Does it recline? And we're going to rethink what transportation is, what we can do with it. You could call a lift to sleep, call a lift to get 5G connectivity and work and collaborate while you're moving. And I think this revolution in mobility may even redefine what work is. Why does your office have to be static? Why can't you get inspiration and put your office wherever you need it? Why can't you go to your meetings and collaborate together. We're on an exciting journey over the next 20 to 25 years, and there will be significant economic impact beyond even transportation. Whole new industries will be disrupted because of this end of car ownership. Even things like organ donation. Most organs are coming from accidents. If accidents go away, we need synthetic organs. So for those entrepreneurs out there, we need to get that business going. So we're excited about this, a world where your children can navigate a city just as quickly and safely as an automobile. And we really need to go back and redesign our cities around people and not cars. Thank you. Very quickly, you went through technology and how it can drive your passion around climate change and where we can go. As you outline this, just tell us a bit more. Like, What can we do? What's yeah. the consumer reaction? I hear a lot about personal sacrifice around your consumption habits making a difference. And that's where the focus is about right. not eating meat and other things. And those are all good things. But that is absolutely not enough. We're sitting in the room here. The answer is not to tell the 6.99 billion people outside of this room, outside of the 1%, that they should change their habits when they're just trying to live. It is our responsibility to have an order of magnitude thousands of times more than your consumption of carbon to change because you have the ability to change policy. You have the ability to potentially join the Extinction Rebellion. Whatever it is, you're emitting 16 metric tons a year. That is nothing. Great. Change your habits. But I want to see 3 million metric tons from each of you, no matter what you're doing. Thank you, Raj. Thank you.